Hey everybody, this is Justin Udy with Real Obsessed. Today I'm with Phil Harvey. How are you, man? Doing great. Very good. Uh, I've known Phil uh, for now probably two, three years, four years, five years, I don't know. I mean, kind of like known, I've known of him for a long time, but then we started working in the same office probably, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's been about six years. Okay, see time, I don't know time that well. Um, but uh, I want to dig into a couple of things that Phil's done really a lot different. Uh, and so let's just go through a couple things, man. I mean, tell us about just a couple things as far as kind of where you're at uh, today, kind of the type of production. Tell us about kind of the, the, the way that you have your business set up, not only on your on your business side, on the real estate side, but even on your kind of investment property side so people can know where you're at now and then let's go back kind of through the journey. Okay, great. So I, I have basically three sources of income through real estate that I've, I've created. One of them is commission income. And that's you know deals that I that I do. Um, I mainly work with uh, investors, you know people that are are wanting to build financial freedom. Uh, a lot of the investors are buying buy and hold properties. A few of them are buying you know properties to flip. And then I've got five great uh, real estate agents on my team that they work more with the retail buyers and sellers. And then a, a great transaction coordinator that helps us kind of run all the administrative tasks um, so that's kind of the first uh, source of income and then in addition to that um, I do a lot of home flipping so I'll buy homes you know fix them up sell them or you know sometimes I'll just wholesale them to other investors depending on on the deal and then the third thing is uh, rental properties so let's see right now I've got um, 56 doors a lot so, of doors. Yeah. It's a lot, man. But you've been on a buying spree, would you say? Like as far as the last like two, three, four years, do you feel like you've kind of amped yeah, that up? Yeah, I mean the, the last couple years haven't been as aggressive. I wish I would have been, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I had a, a pretty good base and then in 2000, I guess nine and 10, I had to sell some of those just to kind of pay bills because you know, the, the commission income wasn't really coming in very well in, mm -hmm. in some of those lean years. So unfortunately I had to get rid of some of those good properties, but you know, just tried to rebuild and, and uh, it, it's been great. So when you, uh, the, the business that you have like with the real estate investors, are you doing more like a, as a coaching basis type thing? Yeah, you know, a lot of people, it's interesting because I, I've helped both the neighbors that live next to me uh -huh. get into the business uh -huh. and then also the neighbor behind me huh. in addition to you know other people that I've met through the years that yeah. have you know wanted to get into real estate investing and just kind of needing that extra education and, and I think that's something that you know I was able to create a lot of value for these people because it's something that you know I have done myself and I, I see the the benefit of doing it. So maybe talk about that a little bit. I mean, what's one of the misconceptions like in working with your neighbors that you have found? And then what are some of the values that you were able to say uh, that helped them kind of get over that hump? Well, I think a lot of people think that, you know, you need to have maybe a real estate license or you need to, you need to have a lot of real estate education to get started. And, you know, if you have a good mentor and you're willing to you know, take what people call risk, take on, you know, something new and uh, willing to, to do something that you've never done before. Um, that's usually the hardest part for people is to just get started, you know, moving forward in the right direction. And, uh, you know, if you can find someone that can, you know, take you by the hand and help you find a good property, you know, if that's you know, a real estate investor or an agent, you know, that'll go a long way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess on your side, I mean, tell us a little bit about, like you've obviously done all this work and set up this business. Tell us a little bit about kind of, now you have, uh, you've kind of been planning for a while that we kind of have, this is what kind of spurred the conversation is that I was like, man, people need to hear this, right? As far as you're gonna be taking a trip. Tell us a little bit about what happened and what you're doing and, and so people can understand kind of what this kind of evolution of working to this point, you know, kind of what's going to be okay. happening yeah. soon. So yeah, my family and I, we've decided to uh, leave for a year and we've ordered a, a brand new RV that's being built right now. And 
we're gonna take a year and travel the the you know North America, uh -huh. uh, United States and Canada. We're gonna homeschool our kids, and we're gonna you know find service opportunities, and we're gonna you know just see all the sites that that yeah. uh, you know our great country has. And I guess what what kind of spurred that is. You know, my, my whole mo motivation for doing what I do, I guess my why, has always been create financial freedom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, you know, one day I'm, I'm sitting in traffic, heading home, you know, thinking, man, how much longer am I, am I gonna do this? Yeah. Um, and I've, I've always been one that kinda does things a little bit unconventional and uh, you know so my why going back to my why you know all creating financial freedom you know I set a goal of once I have so much money coming in in cash flow then you know I at, at that point I wanted to do something that you know my family could remember for the rest of their lives totally and originally it was moving my family to South America but my, my wife wasn't really on board with that <laughs> so the, the, this is your you wife and my wife should go bowling, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. So yeah, th this was something that uh, you know she could uh, grab hold of and and run with, and, yeah. and so you know every everyone on in the family is excited and, and yeah. we're excited for the. Event. She's curious, like, what did her parents say? What did your parents say? Like, wh you know, what did they have to say about it? Well, luckily, our both of our parents don't really give a lot of input. Gotcha. They just listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think originally, um, at least her parents probably didn't really think we were going to do it. Uh huh. But now I think it's getting more real. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I think, you know, they say that they're going to miss us, but you know, they they totally support us, and they've yeah. always been supportive of my crazy ideas yeah so no that's cool you mentioned that you do things a little unconventional like tell tell me a little bit more about what do you mean right well I guess what I mean by that is you know growing up in this society we're kind of we're kind of taught to you know go to school get good grades so that you can get into a good college and, and get a safe secure job yeah and uh, you know I wasn't the best at getting good grades. Um, I ended up going to a you know local community college and going there for a couple semesters and just trying to take in what was being taught and the money that I was spending I felt like I was wasting my time. Yeah. And so um, I you know during this time I was reading books and I read a book uh, you know a lot of people have heard it's you know Robert Kiyosaki Rich Dad Poor Dad and it really started helping me think a little bit different. And so uh, I decided to, to leave school and go start my own business. You know, mm -hmm. I thought that would be a, a quicker way to, uh, to really learn about, about business. And I, you know, I wanted to go into to business and be my own boss and, and you know, help others as well. And so I guess, you know, going back to not doing things like you know unconventionally all of my siblings all of my older siblings they have you know college degrees uh -huh. and so for me you know being uh, the fourth you know kid in the family um, you know not going that route was a little bit uncon you know unconventional totally did you so, get a hard time did your family give you a hard time about it no believe it or not they uh, I, I think they just kind of knew that you know that wasn't for me yeah and and you know that's something that I've always appreciated of them really not putting that pressure on me. You know, I don't, I don't know why you know they, they didn't, but I am grateful that they didn't. They let me do my thing. So. Totally. So you went. So when you left school, maybe just take us through that journey, right? You went through from you ended up, you know, reading a book. You started thinking a little bit differently. You dropped out of school. What happened, right? Tell us. Yeah. About you know, I guess another unconventional thing that I did is when I was engaged to be married. I didn't want to go rent an apartment. And mm -hmm. so um, my wife, my fiance at the time, you know, she did pretty well at saving her money. And, and uh, you know, I came up with the idea that let's, instead of, you know, renting a, an apartment when we got married, let's buy a home and rent out our basement, which will help pay for the house. And then mm -hmm. that way we can, you know, live in a nicer area and not do the apartment thing. And yeah. so, um, you know, I, I, I remember sitting, um, at my parents' house at the kitchen table with 
you know, a random agent that was going to help me write up this offer on uh -huh. this home. And, you know, I, my mom came walking down the stairs and, you know, I'm, I'm 21 at the time. And my mom asked, hey, Philip, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm buying a house. <laughs> and my, my, my mom's like, okay. <laughs> You know, knowing that, yeah, I didn't really have that great of a job and, yeah. you know, I mean, she, she knew my financial situation because I was still living at home and I was just, you know, trying to get, yeah. get things going. But, uh, you know, luckily my wife had saved some money and we were able to use that money for our down payment and yeah. we were able to purchase a, you know, a, a home in South Jordan and we rented out the basement and that kind of paid for the mortgage. Mm -hmm. And so that success kind of started the momentum of seeing what rental properties and residual income could do. So outside of that first investment, what was the next investment? What was your, like your, besides your single, your first home, what was the next investment? Do you remember? Yeah. So the next one was another rental property. It was a duplex in uh, West Jordan on Sugar Factory Road. Okay. And uh, I used to play baseball over there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I bought that and you know, it had a little basement apartment. Uh, the, the home wasn't advertised as a duplex, mm -hmm. but it had a basement apartment and, uh, you know, I called the city and the city said, oh yeah, that, that whole street zone for duplexes. Awesome. So right off the bat, you know, I was under contract on this single family home where the agent didn't list it as a duplex because mm -hmm. they didn't do the research and I was able to snag a property that, you know, already was zoned a duplex and kind of increased the value just right off the bat. Now, did you keep that property? Did you end up selling it? I, I, I ended up keeping it for about four years. Okay. And then that was one, unfortunately, I had to sell during during the lean years. Yeah. So I guess so. on that first one, what was, uh, and I should almost say, you know, because your home was your first investment, right? Mm -hmm. And then that was the kind of the the next like investment in the market. I guess in those first ones, what was the hardest things and what did you learn? Um, you know, not, not having done it before, I learned a lot of lessons. Um, you know, I, I learned that you can kind of just figure things out. And one of the things that I figured out is, you know, this particular home didn't have uh, separate gas meters. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having two units that had one gas meter and having the landlord pay the, the gas the gas bill, I, I decided I'm going to add another gas meter. And so, you know, I'm calling the city to try to figure out how to, what permits I need and, mm -hmm. and you know, the gas company and a contractor to add a, a gas meter. And so, you know, some of those things going into a, you know, an investment, you just don't know, but you, you can figure things out. Totally. So you ended up buying your investment. Now you're working. When did you get into real estate? I got my real estate license uh, at the begin beginning of 2006. Okay, so 12 years, right? You've roughly been in the business. And uh, what happened, right? So, so take us through from there to when you decided from traditional sales to investments. Uh, right now, as far as just curious, from retail sales versus investment properties versus uh, maybe even just the, uh, you know, coaching stuff on the side, I guess, what percentage are you finding your business right now? Not finding and locating, but like, you know what, you're spending, for example, 10% in retail sales and 90% in investments. What, what does your time kind of look like right now? Yeah, I would, I would say right now in, you know, 2018, it has probably been almost 50-50. You really? know, I've, I've had okay. a lot of referrals from, from past clients that, you know, I've been able to help on the retail side, but normally it has been more of like a 70, 30 more investors yep. than uh, retail buyers. Okay. Gotcha. So you're doing retail sales, but it happens to be in the investment world, right? Yeah. That makes sense. And then uh, how many transactions did you guys closed last year? We did 132. 132 transactions plus... How many units did you pick up last year? Uh, let's see. Picked up two fourplexes, two condos, and what am I missing? And a duplex. Yeah. Twelve units. Twelve units. So, out of the fifty-six, right? I mean, that was aggressive. Like a yeah, fifth of your it portfolio, it right? Ended up Basically, being a, little, a little aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Really cool. All right, so you're doing retail sales, right? Uh, kind of what happened, right? You're, you start doing 
Yeah, I mean, I, I originally got my my real estate license to do investment properties. Okay. And once I got in, I kind of started seeing the potential of you know an income that can be created by helping buyers and sellers, and so um, it kind of went that direction, you know. And I'd pick up a, a rental property here and there, and a flip here and there, um, as I helped retail buyers and sellers, and then. You know, it, it was probably where things really turned. It was, uh, I think it was 2010, maybe 2011. Um, I, w I was sitting in a, a training, and I don't even remember what uh, the training was on, but this thought came into my mind of, you know, how can I make a million dollars in real estate? And so while this, you know, presenter is talking, in my my notebook i'm i'm dra drafting up a plan and you know i'm i've got my calculations of my average commission check my average income on flips and then you know my average in uh, unit and what it rents out for and the cash flow so i'm kind of drafting up this plan of you know how i can break a million dollars in one year in this business and uh you know that that year i did just I think 86 real estate transactions. Um, our team did 130, and then uh, I also flipped 24 homes that year, and then you know had some rental income. So I didn't quite hit a million, but I came pretty close. Yeah, and that was in 2011. So yep. now you had a bunch of cash, and you had the ability to even do more. Yep, and then right? and then that's when I started uh, holding on to more more properties and and uh, you know, continuing to do the flips. Talk about the team. When did you decide to start a team and why? Um, I decided to start the team just, you know, the principle of leverage, being able to do more um, without having all of that be put on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. and, you know, being able to help newer agents, um, coach, teach, and train them, and the satisfaction that, you know, that, that gives me. And uh, so when, I believe that was in 2010 when I started with the, you know, bringing on buyers, agents on the team. Yeah, no, and so, and, and just to kind of go just a little bit deeper on the leverage part, when you ended up getting your team, and now when you started doing your crews, right, as far as, uh, one of the questions I didn't ask last year, how many flips did you guys do last year? Do you recall, roughly? Last year, 14. So 14, mm -hmm. but I think what people need to understand is, is like, again, you're running the team, picking up the investments and going to those properties, but all of this is not you. Fair to say, I mean, I, I shouldn't say it's not you, I'm just saying, tell, tell about kind of where your time is spent, what are the things that you're spending your time on and what are you leveraging out so you have the ability to do that amount of work, right? Because right. one person alone can't do all that. Yeah, so you know where I leverage is obviously all all of our real estate leads go to my team members, mm -hmm. you know, which allows them to do the the prospecting and and running around and showing. Which homes. you've trained them on, right? Yes. So um, as far as the flips, you know, I I have contractors obviously that I hire everything out and I kind of train them on what what it is that I want to do on these homes. And most of these homes, you know, I'm, I'm doing the same flooring, I'm doing the same paint, you know, usually the same cabinets, you know, with, the, with minor variations, you know, and so there's not a lot of decision making that needs to, to come into play. You know, sometimes that's tweaked depending on, you know, if it's, if it's a higher end home, which I don't do a lot of higher end flips, but, uh, you know, we'll make changes and stuff that, that will kind of uh, you know benefit those higher end yeah. homes a little bit. There was more. one big one that you did right by the one that I did, right? Yeah, tree tree farm yeah. court. That was a good one, right? That was a good one. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, that that was one I I, I broke six figures on yeah. on that one. That was sweet. So I uh, I uh, you know, I had bought one obviously by there and it was a really good property and we had a chat, I think when you had it under contract, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, I just chatted about the types of showings, the type of people. Um, mine didn't appraise for the amount. Fortunately, they came in with cash, but now we have to set a new comp. Yeah, you, and so you helped me out. It was awesome. Like I got 
way lucky, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, the appraisal, and, and we would have got a new appraisal and the value would have came in a little bit more, but I still don't think it would have came in. It was like that perfect buyer, right? So no, that's awesome. Um, I want to, to know a little bit more. Uh, one of the questions and, and one of the things just that so that people know is, is every once in a while I would, uh, you know, see Phil and I'd be asking questions like, hey, I got a question for you. Because every once in a while we run into, uh, in our business, I feel like uh, a lot of real estate agents end up getting so much in this sales cycle of mm -hmm. just doing deals and doing deals as opposed to maybe something that can be long term. Tell us a little bit more about your philosophy and some of the things and questions that you've had in the past about yeah. people, even about the you know the builder questions mm -hmm. that we were we were talking about before. Yeah, I, I I love that question because you know I I see in this in the real estate, you know sales business where you know a lot of the direction where agents go is you know make more in commissions so you can buy a bigger better house buy a, a, a faster car you know live this this crazy lifestyle mm -hmm. right and so that they're chasing these you know this dream of this lifestyle and for me it's been a little bit different it's it's always been you know I'm 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 not working for money, I'm working for freedom. So just having that mindset, you know, changes the way I spend money, changes the way I, I make money. Because I'm not making money just to pay bills, I'm making money to have freedom. Because that money that I do make, I'm gonna invest it into things that is gonna help create freedom. Yeah. And that's, that's the mindset that I picked up, you know, in my early 20s. And uh, so my, my entire why has been, I'm working towards financial freedom. What do you think? I mean, you mentioned the book. Is there anything else that made you kind of think that way? Anything else that was like, you know what? I want financial freedom because this. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, going back to Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad Poor Dad, mm -hmm. another book that, well, yeah, I guess it's an audio tape that my mom gave me that also had a pretty big effect on me is is uh, Dave Ramsey total money makeover oh yeah and so okay. a lot of people are gonna say that those are conflicting yeah yeah ideas yeah totally because Dave Ramsey is you know stay out of debt you know and pay everything Robert off. Kiyosaki is get into good debt you know yeah. and so I I've kind of taken those two philosophies and merged them into something that has worked really well for me because you know what Dave Ramsey and, and what he teaches in, in his books is to stay out of consumer debt, you know, and so that's something that I had to retrain myself that you know if I carry a credit card balance, it is being paid for completely a hundred percent of the time, mm -hmm. so that I'm not paying interest on consumer debt. Yeah, you know, and then with Robert Kiyosaki, it's you know paying myself first using you know I, I try to spend less than 50% of the money that I make and that money, it's not being saved, it's being invested. It's yep. being invested in things that are gonna help give me financial freedom. So pay off properties or carry debt? Well, that, that is a, a great question. <laughs> and uh, you know, that, that's a whole nother, yeah. whole nother podcast. And, I, and, I, and I, it is, and I, and I even <laughs> brought it up to you before where I'm like, dude, I paid off my other properties and I'm like, now I'm kicking myself, but then, he made me feel good about myself. Like, that's not a bad idea, you know? So it is, it is another podcast, so that, that's true. Um, okay, tell me this, as far as, um, what do you think that there's the, the top five or six things you did different to kind of get to the next level of success for you? And I think we talked about a couple mm -hmm. of them, but maybe outside of those things. Well, I, I think number one is you've gotta have the right mindset. Mm -hmm. You've gotta have a clear vision of what it is you want and you know why you're working why you're working for that you know so if you have a, a clear mindset of what it is that you want i mean that that's definitely something that has helped me and again that's going back to i'm working towards financial freedom so well so you have your goal right mm -hmm. you know what your motivation is we talked a little bit about frugality we talked about knowing where you're going in building a team of success i mean i guess i would just say you know, what are, if you were talking to somebody and say, look, you need to do these five things to make it kind of to get to where I am. These are the five steps I took. What would you say they were? Well, I, you know, going back to finances, I would say train yourselves 
you know, train yourself to not go into debt for things that are not going to make you money. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, I've trained myself. The only reason why I'm going to take on debt is if that debt is going to be paid for by someone else and it's going to make me money. Yeah. So that, that's number one, you know, number two, I would say buy assets first liabilities later in life. Okay. You know, like this, this RV that I'm buying, you know, it, I, I never really bought new and I've decided to buy new just because it's, you know, one, I'm able to afford it, yeah. you know, and uh, it, it's just the best model for our family. But, totally. you know, so we, we've never bought really new cars or, you know, we, we've lived pretty frugal. Yeah. And so we've developed, you know, habits and patterns that have helped us get to the point to where now we have more money coming in than we spend. You know, and that's kind of been the goal is, is if you can create a system that makes more money than you spend, that's when, you know, you have true financial freedom. Totally. That's awesome. So you come back from your trip in a year from now, right? Your kids are like now the smartest kids. Like they're going to actually go into high school now, smartest basically, because they're so dumbest. smart, we'll right? Kind of see how that goes. From the homeschooling, right? <laughs> your wife's smart, so they're going to be like these geniuses. Uh, what's the plan, right? What's the three to five year plan? Like go deep more on investments? Yeah, different, like what are you looking to do after that? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, one of the things I plan on doing on this RV trip is just kind of slowing the pace down, you know, just thinking of what we've been able to accomplish and just having, you know, immense gratitude for that. And then thinking about what's the next mountain I'm going to build. Yeah. You know, and, absolutely. And right now, I, I really love, you know, financial education and, and teaching people how to become wealthy, how to create financial freedom for their lives so that they're yeah. not, you know, on that, that will doing the, the daily grind. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that's something I'm pretty passionate about. And I think, you know, because it's not being taught in schools and colleges and, and at home, yeah. you know, we, as Americans, we have really bad financial habits, generally yeah, speaking. Totally. And so, you know, I think that's something that I, I, I want to do more. Yeah. Just curious, or, and I'm just throwing this out there, and I know we haven't talked about this, but are you going to like document your journey and like be able to like do something with it? Like, as far as, I mean, I know people would love to see it on social media or on YouTube or even if you were doing a podcast yeah. yourself. Have you thought about that? We have, yeah, we've thought a lot about that. And it's it's tough because one of the reasons I want to do this is to let go. Let go and not be connected. But on the other hand, I feel like it could be pretty beneficial and yeah. motivational for people to see what, what could be accomplished. Uh, one thing that we have decided that we will do is, you know, our oldest daughter, um, Ashley, she's uh, 13. We're going to have her be in charge of a, a blog. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she awesome. can get some writing and, you know, learn computer skills while she does it. Absolutely. And then our other daughter, she'll, she'll help edit videos and stuff that we'll make, you know, for ourselves. Yeah. But as far as, you know, if we're going to put it out there, you know, for the world, I don't know yet. Yeah. Well, and I would say this, right? I know one of the things you like to do is help people and you're like genuinely want them to have a different education. And I, I will tell you from the outside, like when you brought that up, I mean, I have never even thought of going a year and leaving, right? Like it's one thing to talk about financial freedom, but it's another thing to like get up and go it. buy an RV yeah. and you're like, I'm out, dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it uh, especially right now with how well the market's going, it's, it's hard to to walk away for, from that for yeah. a year. But on the other hand, I understand that, you know, the ability to make money will always be there. Totally. You know, and so yeah. that carrot that's hanging in front of you, you know, which is money that people always chase, yep. it'll always be there unless, you know, you just have the guts to, you know, if it's something that, you, you know, you feel you want to do, I mean, whatever it is, you know. Yeah. Um, to to make that change, but yeah, it it, it, it was a little tough, but I'm 100% committed now, so I'm I'm excited for the journey. Well, and a couple things people know, I mean, that RV is going to be a little packed, right? How many kids you have? Five kids. How? What are their ages? Uh, so Ashley's 13, Michaela is 11, Andrew's seven, almost almost eight, 
Jackson's turning uh, five, and then we have a one and a half year old. Yeah, and then uh, one of the things we talked about, you also speak Spanish. Yep. Right? Are you going out of the country at all? Uh, we're going to Canada. Okay. So. <laughs> Yeah, we Need we French. might go into Mexico. It's just my, my <laughs> wife's a little uncertain on that. You're but. not gonna stay at the RV park in Tijuana. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> you totally could, right? No, that is funny. Um, another thing. Oh, one of the things we didn't talk about. You love uh, biking. Yeah, mountain biking. Yeah. Yeah, it's cost me a lot of money in uh, ER visits, but uh, has it really? Have you broke anything? I tore my bicep tendon last last year. Yeah. And so I had to have surgery on that, and then I retoured a month later, uh, playing basketball. And then I, you know, have had a couple accidents where I've had a combination of about 50 stitches. Oh my gosh! So did you hear that story about that guy in Oregon? There, there was a I think a mountain lion. There was two bikers. I didn't. Yeah, dude, you should look it up. The guy <laughs> got he got one of the guys got killed. Oh wow. Yeah, and they like did what they were supposed to like. You know, standing their ground and it like attacked. So, wear your like mountain lion spray or something. Are you gonna bike while you're out? We're yeah, we're all taking our bikes. We're gonna be going to Whistler and British Columbia, and you know, there's a lot of great bike trails all over this. So, place. just tell me this, right? Because like, I remember waking up, doing what I want to do, and like, you know then I'm done with the day because I'm hanging out with my family or my friends, but it was called summer, right? Mm -hmm. So how is your conversation with these kids like, hey, we're going to do this adventure, but, I mean, how do you set those expectations of what their day's going to look like so that they're, you know? Yeah, we're going to have to be somewhat flexible depending on where we are and what it is we're going to do. But, uh, you know, there's going to be usually, uh, you know, from one point, to the next, you know, we've got between a two to eight hour drive. And so that's gonna be a, a good time for yeah, the kids yeah, yeah. To, to do, you know, some schooling. But I mean, I don't think there's a better way to learn, you know, American history and stuff yeah. than being in Boston and being in Philadelphia and being in Washington, D.C. and actually experiencing totally. some of it firsthand. So. Do you have a, the blog website set up yet? No, we don't. Okay, well, when you do, let me know and I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. So when people listen to it in the future, they can like click on it and be like, oh look, dude, he's staying actually yeah. in RV pad and <laughs> wherever, right? Hope that thing is they knock on your door, right? No, that'll be good. Uh, I want to go through a couple other things with you okay. and uh, uh, just, I feel like you've gone, done such a good job of letting us know kind of recommendations and really what you've learned over the years and, and the things that kind of got you where you are. Um, but uh, here's a couple things I just want to ask you some quick questions on, right? Okay. Um, you talked about having financial freedom, right? Obviously, at this point, you can leave and, and, and do what you want to do for a year. Now, what is it going to drive? What's the next thing to drive you to do more? Um, I think the next thing is just continue to increase that um, financial freedom so that I can help more people. Okay, okay. So, no, know, I, now that I've kind of helped myself and my family situation, you know, I, the next thing is helping more people. What's That's your process that. for setting goals? Um, well, I, I write them down. You know, one, one of the, the goals that I've set just recently is first part of May, I set a goal to make $300,000 in three months. So that'd be May, June, July, and then at the end of the job, end of July is when we're taking off. And uh, you know, so I, I wrote down the goal and I wrote down how I'm going to do it. And then you know, as I I do certain steps, I'll cross them off and put a date on it. And uh, you know, so it's and then I'll go back and review it. Yep. So every time you set a goal, you do set a date on it, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, and you did that when you set the million dollar goal. You reverse engineered it. Yep. Correct. Perfect. Uh, one is, what is one of the biggest ahas that made your career or your ability to achieve excel? What happened? Biggest aha. I, I guess it goes back to that, uh, that training that something just clicked and I'm just like, aha, you know, and I can actually, you know, make a lot of money doing real estate. Yeah. And uh, there's so much opportunity in this business, whether it's, you know, in sales or investing. Um, if, if you're willing to put forth the work, you can accomplish amazing things. Yeah. Switching gears a little bit. Uh, tell me, uh, if you, uh, who would you have, uh, who would you like to have dinner with, living or dead, and why? Well, let's see. 
business speaking, it would be probably Warren Buffett and or Donald Trump. Oh, know? really? Okay. Just because he's a real estate investor mm -hmm. and he's also the president. So yeah. I'd like to maybe give him some ideas, you know. <laughs> if he was listening to this right now, what would be your question? One of many. I know you'd have a million, but if you had a question, what would yeah, your first right. question be? I, I would ask him, what is the best way to step into the the 100 to 1,000 unit apartment complexes? Mm -hmm. You know, because I've got, you know, the smaller amount of units, but it, it'd be great to really learn how to get to that next level where you're, you know, you're buying, you know, apartment complexes that have 500 to 1,000 units. Yeah. Personal. Who would you go to just for a personal dinner? Well, it'd have to be Jesus. <laughs> That'd be a good dinner. That'd be a good conversation. I don't know if I know what you want to ask him. Just kidding. <laughs> if I want to know me. Uh, okay. What did your perfect day look like? Perfect day. Well, you know, I, I envision uh, with this with this RV trip having a lot of perfect days. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, putting the business uh, aside for a second. You know, my perfect day is just waking up. You know, having uh, just an amazing view of the mountains and or beach, uh, you know, with the water and, uh, you know, just having my family and just doing fun things with no, no worries about time or commitments, mm -hmm. you know, not having to worry about running kids to piano or soccer or flag football and just being able to be present in the moment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, enjoying the time with them. Yeah. What percentage of this business do you think is mental versus actually what you do? Um, I, I would say 80% mental. Yeah? Why would so you much say that? is mental. Yeah. Why would you say that? Um, I would say that because it, it's not really that difficult to find people that are looking to, to buy and sell. It's not that difficult learning how to resolve concerns. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that difficult opening up a, a lockbox to let someone in a house. Mm -hmm. And it's not that difficult, you know, uh, figuring out numbers to see if a property is going to cash flow or not. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really not that difficult. But what is difficult is having the mindset of, of that, one, you can do it, two, that you can overcome fear, you know. And, and so that's why I think so much of it is mental. What have you surrounded yourself with to help you overcome that? Um, well, yeah, yeah, I'm try to surround myself with like-minded, you know, yeah. individuals. Do you uh, think it's people? Do you think it's audio? Is it, is it coaching? Is it, I mean, is it, is it any other outside things that kind of helped you keep in your game as far as to keep that progression forward? Yeah. I mean, I try to listen to, you know, positive things when I'm driving around or, or podcasts. You know, one that I've been listening to lately is a podcast called Morris and Best. It's a guy and his wife that they are, you know, they buy rental properties in, in the Midwest and, and uh, you know, they have a business where they help people, you know, get these same properties as well. Yeah, so. absolutely. Now there's another one I've, I've listened to a few, like the Apartment Building Podcast is one. Uh, that mindset made, made me like looking into like this 30 unit building now. And it's just kind yeah. of like these little things you're like, yeah, like, why am I looking at yeah. this fourplex when I could be looking at this you listen 25 to that, unit, and then right? It, uh, it immediately changes your, your mindset. Yeah. Like, I can do this. Let's yeah. go on to something bigger and better. Absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, other than real estate, right? Is there uh, any other things you're doing to build wealth? Yeah, that's, a, that's another good question. So, you know, I, I've had... Uh, tax advisors say, oh, you know, you need to put, you need to diversify, you need to put more money in the 401k, mm -hmm. and, and I've done that, and I, in my opinion, it's stupid, you know. So I know that there's a place for, for that for certain individuals, but, you know, I, I have, you know, some uh, life insurance that is building and things like that. So, yeah, m most of the wealth is in real estate. Yeah. So, you know, going back to Warren Buffett, you know, he says di di diversification is for people that don't know what they're doing. Hmm. So. I like that. Oh, I like that, man. Um, I give you a million dollars to invest. You have seven days to deploy it. Why do you, where do you invest it and why? 
That is a, a tough question right now <laughs> with the prices here in, in our market. Um, million dollars. I would probably try to find an apartment complex uh, outside of this marketplace. You know? Okay. Yeah. All right. If you had, uh, what other causes are you maybe passionate about? I know we, we kind of sometimes will talk about, you know, having that cup overflow, mm -hmm. right? Where you're blessing the lives of others, which you've kind of talked about and touched on today. Yeah. What are some other causes you're maybe passionate about? Well, you know, one thing that uh, has been motivating is, you know, la last year I have, I have a little brother that struggles with addiction and uh, he was on the verge of, of you know, dying and, and uh, we found a facility in Seattle called the John Vulcan Academy. Hmm. And, you know, having had my brother in other rehab centers, it, it puts a burden on the family because right. usually it's anywhere between four to eight, ten thousand dollars a month. And what's neat about this, uh, this academy is, you know, this, uh, this guy set up, you know, this rehab center for people and how it works is, you know, you pay a one-time fee and then the members work at businesses, they run companies and they provide the room and board for themselves for two years. Huh. And it, you know, my brother's been in over six months now and he's loving it. He's had, you know, really good um, success so far. And so, you know, what John Vulcan has done for him is motivating, you know, to me to see, you know, how I can, you know, use some of the, the things that I've learned to maybe help others. And so you know, I know a lot of people struggle with, you know, addiction, substance abuse, and, uh, you know, that that's definitely something that, you know, I'm getting more passion for. Oh, that's great. All right, I'm going to give you some rapid fire questions. Tell me this, I'm going to ask you a series of some questions, just quick answers uh, of which you prefer. Beach your mountains? Man, depends on the day. If I've got my mountain bike with me, the mountains. Uh, RV or luxury hotel? Well, <laughs> the honest truth is we've never stayed in an RV. So. <laughs> <laughs> it probably is luxury, dude, because it's brand new. Yeah, right? we'll, we'll ask me that question in a year. Yeah, single family homes or multi-unit? Multi-units. Uh, street ball or organized basketball? Organized basketball. So uh, how tall are you? Six five. Six five. So people don't see that when we're sitting down. But we even talked about like buying clothes. In fact, nice suit, by the way. Mm -hmm. We got to get our suits from the same lady, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, even on the, the difficulty on a plane, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Apple or Android? Um, Apple. Zillow or online buyer platform? Um... Online buyer platform. What do you mean by that? Buyer lead system. Oh, well, yeah, that. Just buyer Definitely. lead system, kind of your own. Right. As opposed to paying a company, you're yep. getting your own leads. Yeah. And I knew you'd say that. I, I, I thought you'd say that. Yeah. I just, you know, that's why I put it in there. Facebook or LinkedIn? Uh, Facebook. Uh, cold call or knock doors? Knock doors. The uh, buy existing or build? Uh, for me, you know, I'd like to build and live in. Tell us a story about your Nineplex, please, really quick, while we're going through that. Okay. So, yeah, I've got a, a property in Ogden that uh, it's on a half acre. And uh, the home was built in, like, 1910, 1920. And it was used as a triplex for a while. And then it was used as an insurance agency office. And so, you know, the city says that it could possibly have a total of nine units on there. So we're looking at bulldozing the house and building nine, you know, side-by-side -side style townhomes. Yep. And so. then to, you had mentioned that some people were like, okay, so you're going to sell this. And you said, well, this yeah. is what I'm going to do and yeah. why. We were meeting with the builder and he was just curious why we didn't want to build it to sell it. And, you know, my, my answer to him was, you know, if I've got something that could cash flow potentially you know, three thirty-five hundred dollars 3500 to 4000 a month, I don't want to sell something that can put money in my pocket month after month, and especially if it doesn't have any deferred maintenance or, you know, I'm probably good for 15 to 20 years. Right. You know, so I get that a lot of people want to just 
you know, take the money and run. But again, it goes back to my philosophy. I love cash flow. I love, you know, having the financial freedom to do what I want when I want. So, you mentioned to me that sometimes you feel like an island. Tell me, tell me just a little bit more about that. Yeah, you know, I feel like I'm on an island in the sense that I do things a little bit different than, you know, society as, as far as their finances. Yeah. You know? So I'm all about, you know, buying assets and it, it, because I've done that for so long, it's surprising to me that other people don't do it. Yeah. Because I see the benefit that it has been for me and my family. Yeah. You know, so I see people get raises and they, you know, just get a new car or they, you know, add onto their home and, and it's just a different way of thinking where, you, you know, it, it just seems very clear to me that if you want to not work your whole life, that you need to take some of that money and invest it. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Uh, physical book or audio book? Audio book. Tie or no tie? Um, depends on the day. Okay. All right. Uh, what was your first job? First job, I was a paper boy, fifth grade. Yeah, worst job? Probably delivering phone books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your biggest pet peeve? Uh, slow drivers in the fast lane. <laughs> Dream vacation spot? Probably anywhere I have not been. You know, we traveled a lot as a family, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, we've never been to Europe, mm. which, you know, it's something we want to do. So yeah. I'd probably put Europe. Cool. Uh, best piece of advice you ever received? Uh, buy rental properties. Hmm. Was it someone you knew or somebody outside of someone you knew? No, it, it was basically just reading uh, books on Perfect. money. Best concert you've attended? Uh, you too, but I would say the, the energy and, and stuff that a Tony Robbins, UPW, hmm. con, you know, it's kind of like a concert in a way. Yeah. So I, uh, you know. It is right like a there. concert, right? Yep. Favorite podcast? Uh, right now, I, I really like Morrison best. Yeah? You know? Any other ones you like? Um, let's see, Grant Cardone has yeah. some, you know, that I like. Yeah, he does make you think a little bigger, too, because yep. you're like, ah, oh, I got a 10x this, bro, you know? Yeah. <laughs> How do I 10x? How can I add a zero to this? Uh, book you wish everyone would read? Um, I, I think people should start with, uh, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Robert Kiyosaki and Total Money Makeover. Yeah. You know, most people probably need to go with Total Money Makeover so that they can reprogram themselves on how they spend money. Totally. Uh, is there a book you gift a lot? Um, to my investors, I've given out some of the Rich Dad, Poor Dad series. Yeah, very cool. Um, go to motivation song? Um, believe it or not, like lately, it's been uh, from now on from The Biggest Showman. Oh, Hugh Jackman. Wow. All right. Yeah. My, my daughter would love you, dude. <laughs> uh, biggest role model? Let's see. Uh, yeah, that is a good question. B business speaking. Hmm. You know, that, there, there's some great examples here in this office, you know. Look up to you for sure. And, <laughs> he's just know, saying that he's on the podcast. <laughs> Dave Parker, you know, he's a good friend of mine. He's done a lot of great things as well. Yeah, so. he's done some cool things. What about personal? Personal role model. Role model. Uh, again, I've got to go with Jesus. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Uh, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? It'd be to fly, so I don't have to sit on those cramped airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what would you have for your last meal? It's got to be Mexican food, you know, like the real Mexican food. Authentic. Yeah. Where did you learn Spanish? In uh, Santiago. Chile. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't get Chile food? Well, no. I mean, Mexican food's better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, describe yourself in three words. Um, positive, consistent, and motivated. Cool. This is probably my favorite question, and if you feel free to elaborate on it, because I think sometimes, uh, I, I think about this question uh, every time I ask somebody. I always, you know, introspectively ask myself. But if you could give yourself advice ten years ago, what would it be? Oh man, yeah, there's a lot of 
advice I'd give myself. Definitely buy more rental properties, but in addition to that, enjoy the journey. You know, enjoy the failures, enjoy the struggle, enjoy, you know, the challenge of, of the day and just know that, uh, you know, that, that's why we're here is to learn and to, to grow. And so, you know, that's the, the advice I'd give myself is know that failures are gonna come, you know, struggles are gonna come, expect it, learn from it and move forward. You have a brand new agent that's listening to this, right? They, they, they've done a couple deals, they want to build long-term wealth. What's the first thing that you would recommend they do? Um, as a brand new agent, are they broke? Uh, pretty much, right? Pretty much. They have a couple deals. They've closed, let's say, two, three, five, ten deals, right? They're just getting going and trying to figure out what comes next. Yeah, I would say focus on talking to as many people as you can and enjoy the journey as well. Know that if you'll put forth the work and enjoy it and be positive about it, you know, success will come. You have an agent that's been doing it for five, six, seven years. They're doing high production, but they're banging their head against the wall because they don't have any time anymore. They're thinking about a team, but they're not sure if they should do it. What would you tell them? I would tell them that uh, they should take some of the money that they've made and, and invest that and you know, cash flow producing mm -hmm. investments so that they don't have to feel like it's all on them, you know, that they can put their money to work for them instead of having to work so hard for their money. Yeah. If you are somebody that now is a team leader, like you have kind of your team that you've built up, what is the number, what is the number one thing that you feel like you've done to help them know what you want them to do? How do you, how, what's your first, what are the things you do to be the best leader you can be to have them carry out your vision? Well, one of the things that I try to do is, one, I, I try to help teach and train them on, on their finances. So not only are they learning the skills to be an agent, but they're also learning the skills on what to do with the money that they do make so that they can, you know, create the right habits. And so that's something that, that I try to develop on our team is that we have good money managing habits, which you know, if my team members can, can have success in investing, then they can help their clients do the same thing. What percentage of the time do you feel like they end up doing that? Uh, probably 10% of the time. Yeah. yeah, it's hard. It's hard work. Yeah. It's hard. Once you get that money, man, sometimes it burns a hole in your pocket, yeah. right? It's hard for people to change habits. No, it's know? awesome. Well, if you want to get a hold of Phil, um, you can go to list, uh, utahlistingservice.com or you know, the pimp filled uh, block spot, I don't know, whatever it's gonna be, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, we'll see what we come up with. Yeah, we'll see what they come up with. Um, but uh, man, I'm super excited for your trip. I'm super excited for you. Thank you so much for coming on. It was so good. I think people really get a good perspective of like, you know, where you can come from somewhere and where you can go, uh, what the options are. I love the mindset behind, uh, obviously, I mean, a lot of the things that you've said, like it resonates a lot with me where I feel like, Man, if people would just, I wouldn't even have this business if I didn't invest in properties because I felt comfortable in hiring mm -hmm. a team because then I, I already had money coming in. Yeah. So I was like, if everything fails, at least my investment property can pay my assistant's salary, yeah. right? Because she's putting all, all of her eggs in my basket now, right? Right, right. So I really appreciate you going over that and uh, thanks so much, man. Okay, thank right. you. Appreciate thanks, it. Too.